this tiny payment thing is a giant pain. Hi, ladies. Alex from US Bank. Can she help? How about a comprehensive point of sale system that can track inventory, manage schedules, and customize orders? That's what US Bank Business Essentials is for. What about a new oven? Can US Bank help us there? We can serve loans in as fast as 12 minutes. That would be a big help. Huge. Jumbo. Ginormous. Woo! Woo! Finding ways to make your business boom. That's what US Bank is for. We'll get there together. Right there. Ah, that should do it. Time to call wire nut. <laughs> yep. Call the experts in home repair. The wire nut plumbing electric in air. We're here to help small businesses play hard and win big in Colorado Springs, Olympic City, USA. Thanks to our many partners, we are able to offer great tools. Permit Partner is a new and easy way to navigate the permits, licenses, and fees needed to open or expand your business. Accelerate COS is a brand new small business loan fund. COS Open for Biz is a step-by-step -step roadmap for those just getting started. Plus, our office can connect you with local, state, and federal resources. We love all business, but small business is the backbone of our economy and makes us a more vibrant and interesting community. We're grateful for every small business that chooses our city. We look forward to helping you find success in Colorado Springs. Kaiser Permanente is more than a health plan. We're an integrated healthcare system with care teams, hospitals, and health plans folded neatly into one convenient package. One of the most effective ways we can manage costs and deliver better health outcomes is by leveraging our integrated model to provide our members with the right care at the right place and at the right time. With the long-term savings we offer our customers, superior health outcomes, and convenient, coordinated care. It's no wonder Kaiser Permanente is the preferred health plan for so many organizations nationwide.
If you could find your seats, we're going to go ahead and get started. We got a, a fabulous conversation that we're about to have here this morning. So hello, everybody, and welcome to the Monday, day one or two, however you want to talk about it. So many of you went to the, the bash on Friday that was the kickoff for the week, but this is the first educational event that we're having this week. And so thank you for being here for Small Business Week. My name is Jonathan Liebert. I am the CEO of the Better Business Bureau of Southern Colorado. I'm here today representing the three partnership agencies that have put on this great week for you. So this year it's the Better Business Bureau, uh, the SBDC, that's the Small Business Development Center, and then we have a new partner, which is the Colorado Springs Chamber and EDC. So we have three partner agencies that bring this week to you every year. And every year it seems that uh, talking about small business is more and more important. So thank you everybody for being here. Thank you for all the great work that you do. There's lots of business owners here in the audience today. And so we want to really make sure we give you good information that's timely and useful. So every year when we pick the topics, it's always, we, we talk to people in the community and ask, well, what's, what's one of the things that you're wondering about? What's some of the things that you're worrying about? What are some of the things we want to get some great panelists to talk about these, these things for you today? And so we have a wonderful panel today that um, will be introduced here in a moment. But I wanted to kind of tell you just a couple things before we get started. So number one, you have on your, your chair this document right here. Um, take this with you or scan that QR code and save the site because Here's the deal, we're gonna be honest with you for a minute. So talking to the panel, having some great discussion, and they said, Jonathan, we have an hour and a half for this. I said, yep. So we need like a day, we need two days. I said, oh, I know, but we have an hour and a half. So they decided, this is a great idea, they said, you know what, there's so much information out there on the topic today, and there's, and there's so much new information coming out. They said, well, why don't we pull together a website? with information and citations from things they're gonna to discuss today, and then they're gonna add stuff to this website throughout the year. So this is a resource for you, a free resource that they pull together because they want you to have really good information, and it's not just gonna to stop today, it's gonna to keep going. So check that website throughout the year for more education, more information, more stuff from this great panel. So that way you're getting up-to-date information on this important topic. So thank you panelists for already, already doing some, some great work and really making sure people have good information. All right, so we have a, a good conversation here today for you. We're gonna talk about artificial intelligence, chat GTP, voice search, video marketing, the rise of virtual and augmented reality and social media. But the number one thing that we wanted to really talk about today is this whole you know, AI thing, right? So one of the things that we decided to do when we pulled this panel together was we just decided to ask chat GTP what the top five most important things were for marketing. Those are the top five. And the actual description was written by chat GTP. Some of the questions for the panels, panelists are written by ChatGTP. So we figure if we're going to go all in, we'll, let's just do this the right way. So we have an AI helping to kind of craft this panel and to craft this conversation today. But what you need to know about AI is there's a lot. There's definitely some pros, there's definitely some cons. We're going to get into those. But most importantly, what we will hope you come away with today is what type of information you as a small business owner need to know about and how you can apply it and some of the things you need to be aware of. And this last thing before I introduce our great moderator for you today is this, is that typically when we're talking about some of these things, and, and again, for the rest of the week, really good topics, it's an ongoing conversation, or it's in a year, or it's in the next three months, you need to be prepared or ready. With AI, it's, you need to be prepared like yesterday. This stuff is moving so quickly, so fast, there's a lot of stuff uh, I'm learning about it, but hopefully you'll get some really good information today about what you can do to make your small business better because that's what this week is all about. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to present our moderator for the day. Uh, this is a, a gentleman who's a, been a great friend to all of our organizations. Um, he is the owner of Wolf & Key Marketing. His name is Adam Morley. Uh, he is a, a great small business owner, a, a huge, huge supporter of the community about all the work that we do. And also, I think as you'll see in a moment, uh, what is it, Adam, you're, you're a vintage enthusiast. So Adam, come on up, you're, take it away. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jonathan, thank you very much. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for having me as your uh, moderator today. Um, AI is so interesting to me because it's gonna require us really coming together as a marketing community and a small business community to figure it out, right? It's gonna be a whole new ball game. One of my favorite things about this business is bringing clients along, like and any of, any of these people on the panel will tell you that. Um, our hope is really to educate and bring our clients along on the process of marketing well 
And a big part of that in the future is going to be how do we use new tools? I mean, that's already been part of it, right? What are the new tools that small businesses have at their disposal and how do we use them well? I love having that conversation with clients. So this is just the next really big step in the industry is how do we use it well? So let's talk a little bit about it. Questions. All right. Oh, no. First, we don't even know who these people are. I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves. So go for it. I was just going to tie in my intro in the first answer if I had to. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Timothy Zerker. I am the owner and uh, CEO of A Train Marketing. Uh, we are a Colorado based agency that focuses on marketing strategy, um, rebrands, big website builds, that kind of stuff. My name is Brandon Lee. I own Edison Apps, and we're a small business marketing agency. And mainly we focus on solving problems that small businesses face with you know, digital integration, software automations, websites, things like that. I'm Camille Blakely. I am the president of AdPro, and we are a full-service advertising agency, and we do everything in the marketing space from research, PR, traditional digital media, websites, uh, everything um, that, that you touch in marketing, it's part of our organization. We have 40 employees, and we've been around for 11 years. I'm still humbled by everyone else. I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I doing here? Uh, my name is Daniel. I'm with uh, True In Marketing. Uh, we've been around for 10 years. We work as creative strategy and production, doing a lot of message clarifying, and then also I own Smart Raven Consulting and Coaching. Perfect. Thank you all for being here again. Definitely appreciate it. All the rock stars are in the room. Awesome. All right, so we got some questions. Um, let's try to keep answers to around a minute ish, something like that. So this one is for everybody. This one's fairly broad. Um, how do you recommend small businesses leverage AI to help with their marketing efforts and get a competitive edge? And you can go in any order. I'll start. Um, one of the things that I recommend to all my clients is that you really start to identify who your audience is and make sure you know who it is that you're targeting because there's specific AI tools that you can use that are going to help you develop whatever content or sales material, things that you need for that specific audience. So the first step would be identifying the audience, then the next step is which of these AI tools you could use. And we'll talk through some of these platforms as we uh, go through the conversation today, but I think that's really the key to get started. Understand who you're talking to, and then you can implement whatever tools uh, they're gonna speak to that audience. Absolutely, I mean, and I, I think the other thing I would add on, because it's almost exactly what I was gonna say. Um, no, but I, I think the other thing I would really add on is it really depends on how you're marketing and what your skill sets are. Um, inside of my team, I have graphic artists, I have videographers, and so I don't need to focus on video and graphic art because I have that already, right? I do strategy and copywriting and that kind of stuff. So for me, different tools are valuable because of my role. So I think that's, I think that's a really important piece is to know your team and know your needs, and you let AI help fill in the gaps between. Uh, that's, I think, the best best strategy, and that's what a lot of my clients are doing as well. Yeah, I think the important part is to consider AI as one of the many tools we have in marketing, and the key is you've got to have a strategy and a plan. Uh, you've got to be disciplined about how each of these tools is going to fit into your overarching strategy, and totally agree, you've got to know who you're talking to, because you don't have all the money in the world to talk to everybody, right? So having that discipline to have a, a plan and know how AI works into the plan is crucial. And, and the other really important key is uh, really people still make decisions in marketing for emotional reasons. So having that human component as a part of it, even though we're leaning more into technology, uh, is something that, that is essential. So having an expert guiding you, I think, is crucial when it comes to all of these new great tools we have. It's funny because I was joking with uh, Camille earlier. It's like, I think we're just going to take the smart answers from everyone else <laughs> throughout this process. Because um, everyone on the panel is right. These tools are incredible. Um, and, and I think part of it is that I know as most of everyone here is a small business owner, time is so valuable. And I don't know a single small business owner that has not just felt overwhelmed with the amount of stuff that's on our plate. So if there's any tool that can speed stuff up for us, that's amazing, but if you turn those tools on and you speed up the process, but you've kind of missed some of the foundational basics, I think that's what we're all, you know, it, I was remarking, it's like, you know, we have this panel on AI, but at the end of the day, like, it doesn't remove the necessity for doing some of the foundational work that any of these agencies do really well. And don't let it, don't let it destroy your quality either, because I think that's the other thing that people miss a lot is AI is super smart and it's super big, but that doesn't mean that it's 
a super smart strategist or copywriter or website designer, it'll make mistakes. And if you don't go through and check it or have a professional check it, you can still make some big blunders. I fixed a couple things already for clients. <laughs> Well, and tagging on that, you know, AI is there as an additional tool, like Camille said, that it doesn't replace anybody, right? So AI is just pulling from existing content. So there's a lot of opportunities for plagiarism or for copyright issues that you have to be aware of. And so does your team as you're using these tools. Um, you want to make sure that it's something that's additive to your marketing strategy and it's not replacing because you need that human element where you need the creative thought, you need the original thoughts coming from the human people on your team that AI is just not going to be able to replicate. Yep, fully agree with that. Quick show of hands, who in here has tried chat GTP or like an image generator type of application? Okay, maybe like half. Really interesting. Um, so you two were talking about being more on the strategy side as opposed to the creative side. What are some specific tools you can recommend people use for those? Yep, so um, I mean, I, on, this, on the strategy side, what really is valuable for me is actually is chat GTP. Um, it's really valuable not as a strategist because it doesn't understand everything that you might need to take into, uh, uh, into any individual thought process or, or anything. I mean, if you put it all in the prompt, then awesome, but you have to know the right questions to ask, I think is the big problem. That's why uh, us experts still have jobs, right? Um, and I think the, the big value for me using it is as kind of a second brain, is as someone to kind of brainstorm with. Um, I did that for one of these questions, I can't remember which one it was, because I was like, oh man, what is, what, what, what am I gonna say for that? And I had no idea, and so I just put the question in a ChatGPT. And it wrote a bunch of stuff, and it wasn't great, but it sparked the ideas, and I was like, oh, that's what I wanna talk about, that's the thing, yeah, here we go, okay, and then I, and I put my little response together, right? Um, and I do that a lot for clients and for, uh, for copy and for campaigns and things like that. It's like, you know, if we want to do an, an email campaign to hit all 50,000 customers and we want to drive XYZ and we're worried about this and we're worried about that and we're worried about that. And it'll put something together and it's okay. And then I can take it and I can rip it apart and I can edit it and all the stuff. Whereas I would have to take that to a separate copywriter because I've had no idea where to start and I couldn't think of what, what I was doing, give it to them, take it back, edit, edit, edit. I mean, it cut out probably, it's, it's probably cut out half of my like ideation time because I can jump to something to then build a result from. Um, so I think for me that's that's the big value and also research as well. Um, you can't always trust everything that comes out of chat GTP because sometimes it just imagines resources, right? <laughs> it just says, oh, there must be a paper like that. Um, <laughs> but if you have it do, for instance, the, the new browse system and say and list your resources, list your articles, list your art, list, list your you know studies that prove that whatever readers like XYZ, um, all of a sudden you can trust it a little bit when you go and you click the link and you're like, okay, yeah, this actually is from Harvard Business Review. Um, that really, really speeds it up as well because it can read 4,000 articles and pick the five that are actually relevant to the thing that you really want to know, not that just happen to mention it, which I think is the really big, the really big value add. Cool. What do you think, Brandon? So one of the distinctions that we make with AI is that there are multiple verticals in AI tools. So you have generative AI tools, which is like ChatGPT, but then you also have automation AI tools, which is like Zapier. Um, one of the ones that we recommend to clients that is really relatively new, um, and it, it's complex if you're a small business owner and you're not into development, but if you can get somebody to help you build it, Twilio Segment is a really robust platform that is free to use for up to a number of subscribers and users. But what you can use Twilio Segment for is you can start to really track the people doing business with you, whether it's through website, email, text messaging, social media advertisements. You can track the entire customer journey. You can really start to understand and analyze exactly what's happening with people as they're interacting with your brand where they fall off in the process, maybe you're deficient in your email sales strategy. So you have a really great website, really great landing page, your social media advertisements are great. However, you just don't have a really good email nurturing sequence. Twilio segment will help you figure that out and will help you build it. If you haven't used text messaging before, you can set it up relatively easily. And this is something that from an automation perspective, AI is really helping you build out an entire sales process that all you have to do is manage. Um, so that's one of the automation tools that we use that um, I think is a little bit different than generative AI, but it's something that's really robust and powerful uh, if you haven't been aware of it or used it in the past. Cool, thank you. Quick one for you, Daniel, and then we'll go to Camille. Um, what are some barriers that businesses are gonna face when they're trying to implement some of these tools? How should they also go about overcoming them? So, 
sorry, I had an answer for this already <laughs> in the back of my mind, but um, I, I kind of want to throw something in there from this, this previous segment and, and hit a few birds with one stone, uh, so indulge me. Um, one of my friends is in the crowd, uh, Nikki Cisak, who was the campaign manager for Yemi, so, and she doesn't know that I'm going to shout her out, but uh, tre tremendous landslide 15-point victory. And really, congratulations. That team worked so hard. But, um, and, and this is why, it's, it's, sorry, I'm a little stumbling over my words, but where, I, where this kind of occurring to me is that on this previous conversation, and, and how AI gets implemented, there's so much analysis work can then be done very quickly. I still don't think there's a trade-off for the fact that like 40,000 doors knocked. Nikki and her team went two people face to face and so there's just some things that just, I, I think, okay, so let's play this out as a scenario, is that you can use AI to rewrite a call script. You can use AI to rewrite emails out. You can use AI to analyze zip codes and voter data, and it can crunch that data faster than anyone else. But, you know, we don't have time to go through, you know, every small business, what industry everyone's in this room, but I still don't think there's a replacement for just being in front of people face to face, or, you know, it's like, that's, and that's how you get a 15 point lead in a political race is you knock on 40,000 doors. So um, thank you for letting me call you out, Nikki, <laughs> unplanned. But I think that's the type of stuff that, um, in, in terms of ways that you can implement in your business, I know that in our business, um, you know, we know our target market, we know our audience, and so, okay, I want this email script to be written in a style of author that I love, or that has a warmth to it, it's an invitational, so um, if you get an email from me, there's a little bit of James Baldwin in there, and I apologize, and it's all plagiarized. But like <laughs> that, it would benefit you to have read James Baldwin before you go, hey, write this in James Baldwin, or write this in Dostoevsky, or like, so there's a, a na nature to, you still have to know your client, you still have to do that human interaction. And I think one of the biggest barriers to this is going to be people and businesses that use these tools without the consideration of who you're talking to. And that's why the audience question, I'm like, you guys hit it right on the, the, right on the money at the very beginning. Like, if you don't know who your customer is, and you don't know why they're buying, and you don't know what their, that emotional touch is, it's, you could use the right tools and just run yourself off a cliff, unfortunately. Totally. Can I tag yeah. onto that really quick, too? Yeah, please Sorry. do. Um, so one of the things you mentioned is, you know, the human element. And I think that as AI proliferates through all of the industries that are going to be impacted by, you know, whatever types of uh, time saving or strategy or sales messaging, anything that happens, what I think is going to happen in the future is that people are going to actually want that genuine human interaction. So yes, we can use these tools and as everybody's really excited about them and using them, what's going to happen is there's going to be a point where it's saturated and everybody's like, yeah, I, I can tell that this was written by AI. I wanna talk to a person. I don't wanna talk to a chat bot. They want that human touch. So also keep that in mind that yeah, don't put all your eggs in the AI basket. Make sure that you still have resources available that you're going to be using to talk with those, especially the older generations, are gonna want that human interaction. They're not gonna to want to talk with a chatbot that's really quick. They, they might have additional questions, or they might be looking for you know, some type of connection to whoever they're talking to. So I think that's a big consideration that a lot of the, the buzz about AI is missing, is that there's a, there's a point where that's gonna break. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, so as we're getting a little more specific into this, we're starting to talk about audience, right? So one for you, Camille. Um, how should small businesses start using their customer data to target more effectively? Does AI have a place helping that? How should they go about that? Yeah, I think that using it as a research tool is probably one of the most effective things that, that you can do. And certain industries, there's a lot more um, information out there that AI can go and find. Um, there's some industries that aren't gonna have as much, so you're gonna have to supplement that with other kinds of research tools. Uh, but the key is you have to start with brand. Uh, if, and, and you as small business owners know your brand better than anyone. Uh, and the key is you've got to make sure you know how you're going to go to market with what makes you different and unique. So you can use these tools all day long, but unless you know what you're selling and what you want to communicate and how you stand out from everybody else, none of this stuff works. 
So that's why I talk about strategy. And so you have to have a strategic plan and you've got to be able to really identify how you're going to win in your space. Um, and then you apply tools through tactics, but first you've got to understand your audience. You've got to set your objectives. You have to know what your brand differentiators are and who your competitors are. The only then can these tools that we're talking about, which are incredible, really work. Uh, so a good example of how, how we use it as a tool is in search engine optimization, right? So there's certain verticals we work in, like education, where it's a great place to use AI because there's so much out there in the education world, right? So we can ask a lot of questions, we can get a lot of great information. So, so let's say we're writing a blog in SEO, um, and a good example is like uh, St. Mary's High School, who's a client of ours, right? We can get all the information we can about Catholic education, but unless we apply our knowledge of what the client's goals are, and what's going on in the diocese, what's going on with other competitive Catholic high schools, what's going on in the rest of the world when it comes to Catholic education, and also the uniqueness of this market, and um, you know what we, we really know makes this high school stand out compared to everybody else, AI's not gonna know that, guys. It's so it's that strategy and that human piece that is essential to make sure that you have clear before you start using some of these tools. Awesome, thank you. So I think what I'm hearing is there's always going to be really powerful tools in marketing, but they're not going to do the strategy job for you every time. You still need to know what you're saying and who you're saying it to. AI is just another really powerful tool that we can learn how to leverage, right? Um, thank you for that. So let's shift gears a little bit, and this is for everyone. Let's start with Daniel down on the other end. Um, let's talk a little bit about video. Um, how should businesses be using video to make sure they're communicating well and clearly? What does it look like in the modern age of the internet, in the modern world, I should say? Uh, starting with me. <laughs> starting um, with you. Well, I, I think there's a, I'm going to pull a term from a completely different side in, in psychology and, and on a nationwide level, there's discussion of artificial intimacy. That as our culture, I mean, we came coming out of COVID, there's so much disconnection that I think that when people are looking to communicate messages in general, you know, the more ways that that can have a tactile human touch. And so, you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, film and video, on the other hand, <laughs> someone literally in the car just touched their friends. Good. <laughs> um, but that's, I think there's so much noise in our marketplace. Um, there's so much noise in general when it comes to advertising, messaging, and social media that anything that you can find that cuts through that to create some form of impact. Um, I'm going to pick on my, my favorite campaign real fast. They, they utilize a lot of video. Sorry, you, you might be able to tell me I'm a little team yummy. Um, but they use, utilize a lot of video. The more ways in which your customers can interact with you, you know, people don't buy products, they buy people. Like they can interact with you as a business, the better chance they have to develop the human connection, which creates trust. And then they go, okay, I want to buy from that person because there's something, there's something there, but it's that longing for human connection that at a core is going to seep into everything, even business. So I went through the Center for Creative Leadership, and they taught us when we're speaking to always start a speech with a story, something that engages, something that exposes something vulnerable about you. Because when, when you do something that is, is story related, it brings people in. So similarly, guys, video, it's such a great tool we have in the world today. It's more and more video. Isn't YouTube the second largest search engine in the world? Uh, use video to tell stories, to tell stories about you personally, tell stories about your brand. You know, I talked about everything in marketing is about emotional connection. Well, that's what video does better than anything. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but it has to be authentic. And, and that's the way people, if they can get, to, get into your heart and mind of your brand and you as a person and your team as a person, then you've got their attention. And then you can talk about what you want to do. But, um, you know, the thing about AI is it's never going to be able to capture what really makes marketing sing, which is um, not only that emotion, but it's the magic of really coming up with an idea that touches people, that breaks through everything else and reaches them and it's usually a universal message. And so video is the number one way to really get that kind of t storytelling across. Yeah, I think the messaging in video is, 
you know, again, it's your audience, right? So if your product is a high ticket value item, the people that are buying this product are gonna expect a really high quality video with a really high quality message. Whereas if you're a local company, you have you know, maybe some simple products or services that aren't really uh, life changing for people as far as what they're spending the money on, they're gonna be okay with like some iPhone type footage or you know, just some sort of uh, you know, candid type uh, coverage of, of your, your message, right? So you could do TikTok, you could do Instagram stories, you can do these really easy ways for your business just to get in front of people and say, you know, this is who I am, this is what we're about, this is what we sell or the services that we provide, and you don't have to spend $10,000 on a video production for a commercial that goes on the OTT, right? You can just do this on platforms that are free with the devices and everything that you already have. And a lot of small businesses are very afraid to get in front of the camera because they, they're like, well, I don't want to look bad or I don't want to say the wrong thing. And there's editing software. You can get proper lighting. You can use your iPhone or your Samsung phone and capture 48 megapixel videos. I mean, you can get 4K videos from your little device that is something that people don't necessarily leverage as often as they could. So I think if you have the opportunity and you have a unique product or service, something that you, know, you want to share your mission and vision about, don't be afraid to get in front of the camera and just test it. Just continue to do test takes until you're ready to put it out. Um, but you want to definitely use that because video is one of the highest consuming um, mediums out there that's, that's used for small businesses to share message and even large businesses. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll disagree with you. I think every service or product is life changing, right? Like that's the, if we're selling it, then that's, that's how you have to sell it, sure. right? Even if it's something really small, but I get what you're totally saying the level of, of investment should dictate the level of quality of your content, right? I'm not gonna buy a house from someone who I don't think could really afford the pair of shoes he's wearing, right? It's a big investment, I wanna really know he's really good at what he does, right? Um, so you need to look buttoned up and all the stuff. Um, like, look, I'm wearing a suit today, you want, I, want, I wanna look expensive, right? Um, so I think there's that side to it. I think the other piece I just wanna mention really quick, and this isn't to your question, but there, there are resources out there actually specifically focused on small business video stuff. We actually did one with the BBB. Um, so if you look either on my social or the BBB social, if you go back far enough, I think it's been a couple of months since the last couple of videos, there's actually, I, we did a four part video training on that. So look at that. I'll add that to the landing page that everyone's gonna look at. Um, so it, but I, I think the really big, big important piece is that it, you need to not be intimidated by it. Even if you do sell a really expensive product and you do need to be buttoned up, you can do that. There are local videographers, several of them, that are excellent and not probably as expensive as you might think. If you're thinking thousands of dollars, there's, there's not really, really good ones that are really, really cheap, right? But they're valuable. I mean, and the, the impact that video can have over photos, over text, over even just simple landing pages is so, so much uh, bigger than the investment, it's almost always worth it. I mean, there are multiple studies that have found that, for instance, having a video on a landing page increases the total uh, completes on that landing page by 80% or 82%, right? Um, it's a huge return on your investment, even if the video costs four, the four grand because it's a high quality commercial, right? Um, so I think there's that. And I think the other piece too is that not everyone needs to be everywhere, right? When you're using, when we're talking about video content, everyone's like, oh, I need to be on TikTok. Maybe not, it totally depends on your audience. It goes back to knowing, your, knowing who you're talking to, be where they are, and every platform has a different feel, has a different approach. Be where they are and answer the questions that they have, the actual value pit bits, right? I think as CEOs and owners, or even just marketing directors or sales reps or whoever we have in the room, the instinct is let me tell you about my product and how incredible it is. I'm sure it is incredible, it's life changing, right? Absolutely, but that's not the place for most social content which is most of where video lives, right? There is a place for that on your landing page. This is why this product is great and why you need to hurry up and buy it, right? Most social content needs to be answering questions that they have about your industry or questions that they have about the problem that you're helping to solve. Or if you're selling something that addresses some issue in a hobby that they have, talk about the hobby, talk about the new release of this new product that's really cool that's not yours, right? And focus on adding value and the business, the sales come after. When you add value to people, you get business back almost always. It's always give first and you'll receive eventually. I hey, see Adam. Several, several sales reps in the team and people nodding like, yes, that's exactly Can I do a quick is. follow? Sure. Guys, when it comes to video, you've got to think about the place you're delivering it. You know, social media um, phone video is perfect. I mean, the quality of our phones, you can use that for actually broadcast, but it should not be perfect. It's a relationship play when you're on social media, right? So the more authentic, the more real, the more connected 
um, is better for social. But if you're going to have a, a website video that talks about your brand and what makes you different, it better be perfect. If you're going to run a, a OTT, you know, um, streaming video on Hulu, it better be perfect. Um, and if you're going to run a TV or cable spot, it better be perfect. So it really depends um, what video you're doing um, based on length, on quality, on messaging. So just keep that in mind. Sorry, can I add to that too? Sure, quickly though. <laughs> So, um, so one of the other things with, with video is strategy. So if you're going to invest in getting some video footage shot, use that content in all of your platforms. So you want to repurpose this evergreen video that you shoot, right? So you want to strip out the audio and use it in podcasts. You want to strip out the, the text from the video and put it onto blog posts. You want to create snippets that you can use on all of the different platforms, whether it's YouTube Shorts, you know, long form YouTube or TikTok or Instagram Reels, things like that. So you want to make sure that as you're doing this investment, you're not just using this one resource for this one application. You have multiple ways that you can take this investment and stretch it out over time where you can actually maximize its use and its visibility on all of the platforms where your customers live. And that's what AI is perfect for. Awesome. Um, yeah, one of the really interesting things that I'm seeing is, believe it or not, when I look at click rates on social media campaigns, a lot of times something that was shot on an iPhone and seems a little more ad hoc gets better click rates than the stuff I spent all this time on producing with clients. It's the wildest thing ever. Now, that's maybe at the first interaction rate where you're trying to maximize social media to its fullest. And then if someone clicks on that, they go to your landing page, right? Then, correct, to Camille's point, you might want to have something a lot more professional and put together. But it's really interesting. That's a total brain shift. And it was for me and my clients when social media took over is you actually don't need to make perfect content for social media all the time. If you can hold the camera steady and not make it blurry and not shake your phone around and you know so a little bit of, a little bit more of those specifics we're already getting into it what are some we're trying to get people practical tools here right what are some practical tools people can use if you're a small business owner trying to do this on a budget for example and this is for everyone again I was gonna say, can i go first because the first one i actually have is on is it's focused here. on video right yeah. um so it's it's called uh pictory like p-i-c-t-o-r-y Hopefully, if you look it up and it doesn't exist, I'm sorry. I think that's what it, I think that's how you spell it. Um, but it's specifically video editing for non-video editors, and it also allows you to rip out the copy, and you can take that, copy paste that, put that into a blog, and it's really really effective in that. It'll also cut from you know A roll to B roll. You guys watch this video, you can see them switching from a, from two different cameras so that it looks more engaging. So it's not just five people up here talking, right? Um, so it's a really, really valuable, very fast and easy tool that's specific for video. Um, and I think it has a free version, too. Uh, one of the ones we use is Adobe Premiere Rush. So Adobe Premiere is really uh, complicated, and there's a really steep learning curve for it. But Adobe Premiere Rush is super simple. Um, you can export to all of the different platforms, whether it's uh, an iPhone. You can do 720p, 10, 1080p. Um, so you have a bunch of different options on it, and it's really easy to edit. It's very similar to like iMovie, um, but you can export really high, high quality content from uh, just using this. And I, I believe it's like $20 a month if you have the subscription to Adobe. So that's one of the ones our company uses, along with you know Canva, that's a really great platform as well um, that's low subscription, but a lot of robust tools on it uh, available to you. Way to throw him on the spotlight, man. The, sorry, look at his turn around. Guys, hey, hey, it's a good example if you hire people smarter than yourself on these things, right? Uh -huh. That's wise. You don't have to know that everything. That is wise. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, there's even generative AI uh, within web builder tools to let it roll it out for video and items like that. So uh, tools like a Canva or an Elementor would be you know, awesome tools to use. But we'll put the full list on the landing page later. Right. When <laughs> hey, Carrie, Carrie, what do you use when you're doing blogs? Like, uh, like in that example I gave where on the education, right, what do you use to find the info? And then she adds the human element after she gets the information. Right, so um, we are using ChatGPT, and I think that what I've found is that it's just, it's natural language programming. So um, to what they had said uh, earlier, it's, to summarize, it's, it's the inputs are as important as 
to what you're going to get out of it. So you have to put in accurate information, you have to have that strategy, you have to know your audience, and you have to put that information in to ChatGBT in order to get a quality product out. Well-crafted prompts. Yeah, so that, that little example is a message to you that if you don't feel like you're up to doing it, hire somebody else to do it. Or ask somebody that's a colleague or a friend who's comfortable with it. I think in, in marketing and in all aspects of business, you have to know what you don't know. And so I defer to these guys all the time. And you have to, you know, each member of your team, you have to know who does what the best. So I think it's just really, really crucial, when, especially when you're using these tools. The other thing too, guys, you have to think about um, other, other clients who may be at risk by using this if they don't have more information. Um, you know, going back to that St. Mary's client, we had a long discussion about how AI is affecting education. You know, we talked about cheating. We talked about kids who, you know, we used to have to look at encyclopedias back in my day. And, you know, we might get the nugget of information, but they were usually so poorly written, you know, we had to rewrite it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, ooh, it's a whole different world now. Um, so it's, it's got to be a matter of what each industry, you know, addresses and making sure to use it responsibly, because sometimes it can really be harmful, um, where you've got to make sure thinking is involved, especially in an, in an industry like education. Well, you guys want me to talk? You want to go? <laughs> um, I feel so bad for saying this. I'm going to be the obnoxious one. I think still the, one of the best tools you can use, talking to your customer. I would highly recommend that the, one of the best things you can immediately do before you do video planning, air planning, any type of budgeting, go have a really, really awkwardly vulnerable conversation with one of your customers or five of them and ask them, hey, what are we doing right? What could we do a lot better? Like those type of awkward conversations actually are probably the type of fuel and meat that we all on this panel love because if you come to us and go, hey, our customers told us that you get us when you do this or this is happening, but we want to now explain it on a larger scale. Now we can take that conversation. But a lot of times, whether it's AI or any, any of our, our brilliance on this panel, um, it's just not a good replacement for your customer guiding the conversation of what they're looking for or why they're even buying. I'm still amazed that so many times, like, it's, you know, it's like, well, do we know why our customers are buying from us? That one, as basic of a question it is, is still, like, you could be doing this for a long time and still go, oh, yeah, we forgot that, or that's the thing that we're wondering. So, and then, then come over to us, spend thousands of dollars, and, like, and we'll gladly create amazing content. But um, is there enough time to add on? Well, I'm asking, so I'm just going to throw it in there. Uh, <laughs> Why don't you just go ahead? I just realized, like, wait, there's no we fair way to do that. We know he's going to do it. Let's just have him say it. Because talking about the video, um, the video conversation earlier, there's a time. Um, how many of you guys remember... I don't, it was not this presidential race, but the previous one, Elizabeth Warren's announcement video. And it was like an iPhone video, and she's opening a beer with her husband in her kitchen. It was so incredibly awkward. And it was, whatever, whatever your politics are, um, it was so incredibly awkward as she's like, hey, America, I'm like you. And it was just like, oh gosh, <laughs> this woman is not like us. Um, whoever did her messaging, and that's where, whether it was an iPhone or whether they pulled a $30,000 Ari Alexa camera, whatever they had filmed that on, someone misguided her on how to connect with normal human beings. And so, like... Maybe this, it was AI. Oh, gosh. Well, and, that, and that's the type of thing is that, like, that, that conversational piece, I, I can't say enough that, like, whatever you do, whether for format, whatever style, whatever degree of production, you need to go have like a really painful conversation with the people that you want to sell or that you're serving because they'll tell you and they'll give you real heads up like, please don't waste your time doing that. You could just do this for me and I'll buy 10 times more from you or vice versa. So let's connect the dots on that. So let's say you have focus group with your customers, right? Give them a meal, they'll tell you. People want to tell you why they're buying and why they do what they do. So then you identify through that process your perfect customer and then use research, use AI to go find more of them. That's how you connect those dots, right? And there's the, all these great tools can be ways that you do that. But finding and getting that information first is crucial. Thank you very much. Um, 
So let's talk a little bit about voice search as well. Um, that's something fairly new to the scene with Alexa and Google Home and even talking into your iPhone. Uh, my uncle likes to yell at Siri in public. <laughs> Siri, how many whatever, you know? I'm like, oh God, this is exactly what they wanted us to do though, right? It's bot abuse. Yeah, so how should businesses be leveraging voice search? What are the best tactics if you wanna sort of maximize that new feature in the technology world? This is for everyone as well. I can start, I mean, a, a big focus of our team is SEO. Um, and so we focus a lot on voice search because it's something like 20% of all searches are some kind of a voice device. And whether that's Siri or Alexa or whatever, Google has one, Microsoft has one, they all have voice search. Um, I think that there's a couple of really important pieces to, to remember when you're thinking about voice search is A, it is far from some kind of a silver bullet, right? It's not even as good as just general traffic from Google to build business because a lot of the answers are very, very short. And so it's really valuable if you want to become the ex if you are the expert and you want the world to know that you're the expert in whatever specific vertical or specific service or whatever it is, awesome, you can give information. But you gotta remember a lot of the times when you ask Alexa how many people are, are in Colorado Springs, she's gonna go to a site, find a number, tell you the number verbally, they do reference now the, lo like the location from such and such dot com, the population is X. But that's it. That's all the recognition you get out of a person. And so if you are in some kind of a very special thing that gets a lot of quick questions, I would think like a, a hobby industry, for instance, that's always like, oh, how do I do this thing again? Quick answer, there you go. Then it's really, really valuable. If you're trying to sell a complex B2B service, voice search is probably not the first thing to be focusing on. I would, I would focus on traditional search where they're doing big, complex queries. Because if I want to talk about what's the best way to develop a marketing strategy to address XYZ customer? I'm not gonna ask Alexa that and get a five word answer that means nothing. I'm gonna go to my laptop, I'm gonna search it, I'm gonna look through several websites. And I think that's where a lot of businesses are getting sidetracked. It's the, I, I need to be everywhere syndrome. Voice search probably isn't for everybody, but it's perfect for certain. Does that make sense? For certain types of industries, certain products. Yeah, I think I have two things on voice search. So the first one is, Businesses have to understand from an SEO perspective that voice search is vastly different than your long tail typed in search, right? So when you're typing in something to search for it, your brain is working differently than when you're speaking. So with voice search, your long tail keyword's gonna be slightly different because you have to sort of anticipate what that vocal would be. Um, so you have to have this conversational type long tail keyword that's different than your basic SEO long tail keywords. Um, so with that, the, the second part to this is that there are a bunch of companies that will charge you a ton of money to set you up on voice search. Don't fall for them. They're, they're not doing anything that you can't do yourself. Um, and what they'll do is they'll lock you out of certain accounts if you don't pay for them. So be very cautious about someone setting you up on voice search or calling you in your business to get you on Google, to get you on Bing. Um, here's the thing. Number one, you can do Google business profile on your own, you can log into Bing business profile and sync it to Google business profile, so you only have to update that one place. And then you can go to Apple business profiles and set up your Apple map location too. You don't need anybody else to do that for you. Um, the key is going through your, your content and making sure you have conversational keywords on your website. And on the landing page that you can access via that QR code, we do have some listings there for voice search on, on websites you can look at and some uh, strategies and tactics you can use to implement voice search into your business today. Nice. So let's talk about the ways voice search can be an advantage, right? You've heard us talk a lot about the human touch and how important it is, but this can be a great way to get to what you need quicker. Uh, I have a bank client who does not use tellers. They've completely gone away from it. You know, in, in, the, in the current employment um, environment we're in, it's hard to find good people, especially, you know, starting out. And I'm sure all of you gone, have gone to banks where, you know, they're very young, very, very much not as well trained as they should be and can't really help you with anything. So you walk into my bank client and, and it's just a little pod in different locations. There's not a human being in sight. And I really had a hard time with this until I really thought through it and walked through it and tried it myself. So what happens is you step up and this voice search, right? I say what I need. Well, what immediately happens is they find out exactly what I need and then they have a human being, much more seasoned and experienced than the 20 year old that would normally be there, come up on the screen. 
And so they've connected me with somebody somewhere in the world that can give me exactly what I need. So I have that high touch, but they did it through voice search to make sure they got me to the right person. Do you see what I mean? That's where these tools really start helping us and be efficient. And guess what? It's much more profitable for them because they don't have all that manpower cost. Yeah, a tiny real estate, good point, though. I'm just thinking you're so much more gracious than me because if I, that was my baking experience, I would immediately walk out. I don't, <laughs> I want to talk to a human being. <laughs> but you did pretty fast. Oh, gosh. Um, yeah, I, I, you, you mentioned conversational keywords, and, and I think that kind of goes to my, my shtick, I guess, for the day is, you know, the best way to hear and find those is through conversation with your clients to see what language they're using, what approach they're taking. Um, and, and there's a, I, I think in, in all these things, like knowing your, earlier we talked about, you know, it's like as AI increases, the desire for human touch also increases as well. There is a part of business where that also can become a, a, a competitive edge, or now you have a premium product. Because um, I think, uh, use banking for an example, and, and you're much more gracious than me, I guess. <laughs> I want to see that person there, I want to know who they are. Um, but the banks then that will offer the, hey, if you walk in, there's that personal banker, and they, you know them, and you're investing millions of dollars with them, and all your accounts are there, they're going to be now the premium service. And so there's a, a deal, it's like, you know, uh, call centers and the automated, you know, robo phone centers that you call into. I don't know anyone who has ever really loved going, oh, man, I love calling American Airlines and getting a call center. That's, that, that does it for me. Um, but like that, that part, then any other airline that does, hey, every time you call, you immediately talk to someone or now those businesses charge a premium for it. And so I think there is a consideration is that there's things that AI um, and all these tools that they can speed up your process, but there's ways that I think you can lean into the edge of going, well, wait a second, maybe we have now a nice offer that other companies can't compete with, and people go, well, I want to keep coming back to that business over and over again because they know my name immediately or they, that interaction piece. So let's go back to how important brand is, right? This puts a lot of pressure on marketing because if peop, you know, people are getting information different ways, you need to make sure your brand is clear and that people already know who you are and you have a relationship with it. So these tools are effective. It goes back to what Brandon said about consistency. So when I walk into that, that little pod and they do a voice search, the human that comes up should say something about the brand that is something I recognize from something I might have seen on an OTT commercial or um, a billboard or a print ad, right? So that messaging is really crucial. And the other piece of that is internal communication. So if you spend all this time and energy identifying your target audience and your brand and what makes you different and all the, the stuff we've talked about, your employees need to understand that first and foremost before you go to market in any way. They've got to be able to talk the talk. If you've got a mission and vision statement, every single employee should know that so there is consistency whatever the touch points are with your marketing. And one of the things that we, that we do specifically for our customers in order to get that employee buy-in into understanding where we fit in the customer that's calling me, you know, like where, where are we in their life? Because it's very different. Um, you know, I have marketing directors, I have COOs. Well, we fit in very different parts of their life and we work very differently with both of them as clients. Um, we do what's called persona designs and you guys can do these on your own. It's actually a great tool that AI is good at sometimes is you can describe your customer and say, now give me a persona design and if that, that term should, should result in a pretty good description. Um, but we actually create like little graphics. So it's like, this is Jim and he is this and this and this and he likes his, his favorite sports or XYZ and he has you know 2.5 kids and all the things so that I can remember when Jim calls, it's very different than Lisa who has no kids and has this income and her favorite sports are these because you you're gonna those, talk differently. Did you use AI to create those personas or did you do that the old fashioned way? We do it the old fashioned way because we find we can't get the touch just right, right? It's all about the personal touch, right? Because an AI will be, Exactly, exactly, exactly. And I think, but it can help you get there closer, right? It can help you get close to it and then you as the CEO or the marketing director is like, yeah, but my gyms don't always like basketball actually. For some reason, my team, they're all, they're all football people, right? Cool, yeah. then I need to ask 
Did you see the Bronco game yesterday? That's cool. How can I help you with your banking problem? So what we're talking about is target audience, okay? And all we're doing is fleshing it out a little bit and talking about personas. So he's bringing humanity and a full character to that. And I love that. We do that too, where we actually do a poster and a profile of, yeah. this is Bob, the builder. And here's what he likes to eat. Here's the streets he likes to drive down. You can figure yeah. this out, guys. This is the beautiful beauty of digital media. Here's his political party. Here's how much money he makes. When I, went, when I talked to you about find your ideal customer, go find more of them, well, this is how you find more of them. You get very specific, and then you can do anything you want. You can buy a paid social ad. You can make an organic post. You can do a pre-roll television commercial. It, it's all about knowing who that is, and, and what we're talking about is bringing that person to life a little bit so it becomes a multi-dimensional character. Yeah, we, we, we put them right next to, when we do it for our clients, we put the little sign right next to the screen. There's, there's little things you can buy that actually take to the back of a, of like a computer screen, so it's like, here's my email stuff, and then right here, here's Bob, and there's Lisa, right? I'm like my two primary personas, so literally when they answer the phone, it's like, oh, this guy's a construction guy. This is Bob. I need to talk about these things, right? Nice. Um, it works really, really well. And sales reps and whatever. Yeah. I mean, your sales reps should be able to do that automatically. But <laughs> and I know it sounds like you know we're making a lot of generalizations, guys. But you, again, you can't be all things to all people. You've got to get really smart at who is going to be the target audience that you're able to get the most business from. So that's why that's so important. You have to have that discipline. What I, something I've noticed is SEO, take SEO as an example, it's one of the oldest marketing tactics around, right? Google's been doing it a long time. Clients ask about SEO, how do I get better SEO all the time? So it's interesting because voice search, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but voice search seems to be the next iteration of ways to deliver information, which often comes from a company like Google or Bing, right? Um, for example, you'll notice that a few years back, Google started giving you results at the very top that it thinks you want to read. Give me the top 10 MLB teams right now, and it'll list 10 to 1, right? The same thing happens on the voice search side. It'll tell you those top 10 things now, right? And it'll put it on the screen. But it's really just a way to simplify the delivery of information. So the way SEO is actually done now is still through content. Right? But the way it's thought of is specific keywords. So SEO is more, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but when content is created, it's basically, and Google reads this content, right? It says, all right, I'm going to show this site first if it's mobile friendly. I'm going to show this site at the top if the information this searcher is looking for is really easy to digest, if it's simple. Right? If it's to the point, if they don't have to scroll and scroll and scroll on the site to read it. So now we're starting to look at that bite size information and how it's delivered to people. It's really not vastly different than what the trends have been so far. No, it, it absolutely, it, voice search is just SEO different and basically it's SEO shorter. But I think the, the big, the big, big piece there, and I think you, you hinted at it, it's still all about adding value. It's still yep. about the person wanted to know X. I gave them the information. The, the sites that don't do well, that don't convert, but have great SEO are the ones that tell you the whole story of the recipe. Websites do this all the time. It drives me nuts. The story of their grandma and how she came up with this recipe and blah, 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 blah. I don't care. <laughs> Give me the freaking recipe, right? Yeah. Like, I don't care about your life story. And yeah. business websites do that all the time. One common thing our questions ask, blah, 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 blah. Your answer is down on paragraph eight. And it might be bolded, so that's great. But like, that's not the way to do it. It's get them the answer that they need. And voice search optimizes for what's the answer right now? Like, what's a spreadsheet of the top ten? What is the you know the fastest way to get to the answer? That's what yeah. matters. So one other thing with SEO that that is going to evolve, I think, very dramatically in the next maybe five years because what Google does now is it presents you with the websites that fit whatever schema that Google wants to see, whatever the content and keywords are. But with AI, it's going to be able to present actual answers. So as this starts to evolve, and it probably could be really quickly, um, it's going to replace search in the way that we're doing it today. It's going to have probably at the top the answers that people are looking for, so they no longer have to scroll through the top 10 results. They can find exactly what they're looking for here. Now, if they're saying, I want to look for restaurants near me, that's very different, but if you're asking about a product or a service, 
that is not the necessarily a local thing that you have to visit, the results that are going to come up are going to change. So as you spend time thinking about SEO, don't go all in and just put all of your eggs in the SEO basket because that is going to change and we're just kind of keeping track of what's happening with how search engines are producing these search engine results pages and what information is going to be at the top. Uh, paid ads are going to be something where, you know, you could be on the first page of Google, but you're three folds down. You're not even where you can, people can see you right away. So it's just something to keep in mind that as this evolves, that's gonna be a consideration for marketers um, to also contend with and, and how we combat where our clients are being placed on, on the search engine results pages. Cool, thank you. Um, so we're going to take some questions in a little bit. I want to get some final thoughts from our panelists on what we've covered so far. But if you have a question cooking in your brain, um, we'll get to it in a second. Um, so let's do final thoughts. Um, and feel free to converse as normal, go back and forth, however you want. Um, but what are sort of your, what are the things you want to leave small business owners with when it comes to utilizing AI and, of course, utilizing the modern landscape of technology? I think the, the thing I would say is trust your own instincts, right? Marketing is still a, a, a very instinctual business. You know your customers and your business better than anybody. And test things with AI, um, you know, research things with, with AI, but make sure you're connecting with your own employees, with your own customers, with your potential customers to get the really, really important information that you need. And that's about behavior and AI does not address behavior, right? And that's really what, what marketing is all about. You know, you bet go back to the SEO discussion we were having, another good, good industry where you can get a lot of AI information is the automotive, right? So we use that to really find out what vehicles we should be recommending to a certain client, like let's say Kia. But I was just in a meeting the other day where we thought we had everything all planned out, and we, we knew what was going on, and and we, we knew what the competitors were doing, and we, we said, here's what you sh we should write a blog about. Here's what we should be you know, talking about. And they're like, oh, no, no, I sold all that vehicle last week. And it's like, oh, crap, we didn't look at the inventory right when we walked in. Do you know what I mean? It's, you've got to have the real-time things going on, and that's why you can do all the key keyword research in the world. You've got to make sure you're connected with your client about you know, what's happening there and make sure you're very involved in that because it's still about your brand. You have to make sure you infuse the brand in whatever messaging you have. Um, you know, you, you write great SEO copy for a website, um, but every time I take that from anybody who's brilliant at doing the SEO and then I infuse brand because that's what's going to make people to really take action. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, okay. I, was, I, was, I, was, <laughs> I gave him the look. He said, "Oh no." Um, so, <laughs> I mean, I think, I think there, there's, there's a couple of pieces that I would say as final thoughts. The first big one, because I always go back to strategy. That's my my favorite thing. There's advantages to being the first mover in a marketplace. So, amongst your competitors, there's advantages to be the first one to have AI-assisted video every single week or every single day on your Facebook and your Instagram, right? There's advantages to being second mover of saying, wow, he messed up and he did it wrong. He wasted weeks trying to figure out this thing. I can do it in a day and it's so much faster. There is no advantage to being the last person in a marketplace to do something. That applies to AI, it applies to video, it applies to SEO, it applies to you know, having the conversation with your clients and having real valuable content. It applies to knowing your audience better than anybody else. There's no advantage to being the last mover. Um, and so I would really, really uh, push everyone to just experiment and start doing some of the things. You've gotten several good pieces of advice, and I think there's, there's been more information on the landing page, but I think going out and actually having those conversations, going out and starting to play with the tools is going to uh, accelerate how fast you can use any of this or, uh, or apply it or give it to your team member and say, hey, this thing does half of your job, do that, and now I want double out of you, right? That kind of stuff. You cannot get without experimenting, and you can't just assign it to someone in your team and be like, hey, do this, figure out this AI stuff, and figure out what, what works. Mm -hmm. That's not gonna work. You gotta actually play with it yourself to see how it works. Then you can make decisions. Same thing with video, same thing with SEO, everything else. I mean, experiment. It can't hurt too, too much until you post it, right? That, then, then, then there might be some danger. But as long as you're playing in your office, spend an hour on it, maybe your hour's worth a lot of money, but it's still probably worth the learning. 
All right. I'm just checking. Trying to be courteous, right? Um, so my final thoughts would be, you know, think about the application of whatever tool that you're looking to use, right? So when you're, you know, in construction, you know that you're going to buy this, this bulldozer and it's going to do X, Y, and Z for your business. The same thing applies with any of the technology that we're talking about today. Understand what is the application that you're going to implement and how is it going to either change for the better or worse your company or, you know, change what you do for your clients. So understanding that, you know, AI and all these marketing tools that we're talking about are just tools in your toolbox. Make sure that they all have a purpose. Make sure you're not just absorbing all of these tools, but you're not really utilizing them, right? I, I'm guilty of that where I buy a ton of software and I maybe use 10% of it. But the 10% I use is really great and I'll eventually maybe get to the other 90%, but you see things, they're shiny and it, this is gonna great, work great, but I haven't thought about, well, how am I going to actually implement this in my daily work or in the work that I'm doing for my clients to make a difference. So think about what tools you will you need to use and then sort of research and find the best tools that are gonna have the most impact for you. Most of the tools that you can get out there are free or they have a free trial that you can start to use up to a number of you know iterations or whatever it is that you're using. So I say research that first, find the tools that you need and then start to implement those with your team. And don't be afraid to change course if you find a tool's not really delivering what you thought it would or how you understood it was going to work. Um, but really just start with the end in mind and think about how you're gonna make that change and impact with the tool and then start to pursue those uh, different avenues. Okay. <laughs> you gave me a lot of time and I'm still not ready, but you gave me a lot of time. <laughs> um, as everyone is sharing, I think the thing that came to my mind is if you could take the time that AI saves you and then put it to, uh, so I'll give you an example. We have um, an incredible team at TrueWind and they're brilliant. I would prefer they not spend, you know, all day writing emails. So AI does it faster. You know, if they can cut down two hours of sending client contact via, and it's just like, oh, spit this out, da -da -da, you know, out it goes. Um, but as a business owner, so I'll just take off the marketing hat for a moment, just as a small business owner, um, like many of you, there are moments where, gosh, there's just no replacement for me going, okay, let me call the customer directly. And in 15 minutes, I can do what it may take several other people, hours of debate or deliberation or, well, we don't know what to do with this customer. And in the number of times I've told our team, like, well, let's just call them. Let's just talk to them directly right now. And that dynamic, I, I cannot emphasize enough that use AI. It's going to save you a lot of time. Um, there's, I think when um, I used to live on the East Coast, one of our clients was, um, they did all the vacation rental homes right along the, the Gulf, sh Gulf Shore of uh, Florida. Uh, beautiful, beautiful vacation homes. And we would do uh, the, the ad buys, so, and we knew our target market was Midwestern grandmas that hated the snow. And so every time a blizzard would come through, Ohio, Wisconsin, we would target zip codes to those blizzards going, hey, would you like to go somewhere warm? And like, the, I mean, there's a certain efficiency to what we can do these days in terms of hyper-targeting and target audience. But I remember personally going to some of those vacation homes um, not, not as a, a person who stays, that was way too expensive, but, the, uh, but as just meeting some of these clients and multi-generational families and seeing kids run around and the interaction they had and, and just the relief that these grandparents felt seeing their families all underneath one room, like I just don't think there's any trade-off for the type of tactile, emotional narrative that comes from when, I'm, I'm gonna, someone, one of my friends in the crowd said, oh, no, give us the tea, give us the saltiness. I'm like, okay, fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, politics, and this is probably I'm going to say this because I don't know any better. Um, like our last cycle here in the city, there was a large amount of money spent on attack ads. I think one of the things that with uh, OpenAI and ChatGPT, it's not, it's not plugged into the internet. It's fed a database ahead, so it's not relevant to the last two to three years. How many things have changed in the last two to three years? How many people's political stances, views, personas have changed over the last six months? Like everything is so evolving so quickly. And so people who are running traditional campaigns or marketing efforts that go, well, we'll just throw $200,000 of attack ads thinking you'll make a decision this way, that doesn't work anymore. And so there is this big push, even in our local city that we're watching play out right in front of us, 
that the need to talk to people directly, to get their insight, to let them inform us what they want, that's going to be the winning strategy for business, politics, marketing, anything over the next 20 plus years because it's going to be the thing where it's like, oh, we asked this to tell us who you are and people are going to say, that's not who we are. You're still going to have to do the work of picking up the phone and meeting with your customers to ask them what they want and that would be great. Then tell the AI what to do. You made me think of something that might be a good idea, because you talked about how important it is to pick up the phone and call customers, but then you also said, I want my employees to use AI to send emails. Well, to me, that's inconsistent, because we talked about brand, and if, it, if you get this email that's just clearly unemotional and just factual, what if you just, for the first two lines, had your employees do something that's a little more outreaching, a little more relationship-oriented, just a thought? Because as we talked about, there's going to be this pendulum swing. There's going to be so much AI. If you can do things differently in your business where you've got the human touch, where you actually show you care, hey, how, how what did you think of the Nuggets game last night? Knowing they're a big basketball fan, that's that relationship that will never go away. And so that can be something that really makes you stand out if you use the tool, but you lead with the brand. So just a thought. Yeah. And just, and just to add on as well, I mean, I think there's going to being really personable with your emails, for instance, which is inherently not personality driven, right? Because it's text, it's copy. Um, a, lot of, a lot of groups for a lot of different industries, realtors use this all the time, but there's nothing stopping the rest of us is using video outreach instead of actual emails. Um, I, have a, I have a couple of clients that no longer do emails to their clients at all because they're, they're B2B, they're like us, they have, you know, 100 clients that matter. They don't do emails anymore. They do quick video messages, right? Only ever, because they said we're wasting so much time on copywriting and then editing and then, hey, Jim, would you take a look at this? I'm not sure if I said this right. Just have the conversation, right? But you know, you might not be able to get a hold of them, and so they just do the quick video, which really works. The other thing I just wanted to touch on was um, a lot of AI is two years in the past, but there's actually a lot of tools now that are, are current, that are current. And so even ChatGDP, um, Elliot, Actually, actually told me about it like the week it came out, and I had missed the announcement. Um, even ChatGDP has a has an online browsing function that you can enable, um, and so your data doesn't all have to be old. Does that make sense? It doesn't. It doesn't take out that it has to be personal. You have to actually know the community because ChatGDP, even if it can search the internet, doesn't live in Colorado Springs. Doesn't understand the culture, right? Um, so I just wanted to wanted to throw that out there for anybody. And video email, you have to have a service you go through to do that. They cannot oh, yeah. just do an email, just so you guys, like BombBomb's a great local company. I'm yeah. sure there's a whole bunch. But there's a, there's a fee to that, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, there's a bunch. And Loomly is a really good one if you have, if you have digital services. So we use it a lot with our clients because I can show you my screen, where's the function, the thing the client asked about, and send them, send them a you know, five-page how-to. Let me just show you. Here's what the button looks like. Click that. Go here. Do this. Do that, which is helpful. One other thing is... Um, an exercise that I would put out there for everybody is twofold. Um, number one, think about how you're going to use any tool, whether it's AI driven or just a marketing tool. Is it going to be customer facing or is it going to be internal? Because that's going to drive how you utilize that tool and then does it impact your customer relationships or does it just impact your internal culture? So start there and then on the base, like automation is something that I absolutely love. So as a business owner, one of the things I did years ago was I started to journal my entire work week. I went through and did everything that I do every day. Just take a journal. How many emails did I send? How many times did I do this task in a week? And then find those repetitive tasks. And then you ask yourself, me as a business owner, do I actually have to have my fingerprint on that task? If I don't, I'm gonna automate it. If I can replicate this in a number of ways to make it so that I save three to four, maybe six hours a week in doing repetitive emails or constant back and forth with people, scheduling meetings. How many people use just email back and forth for scheduling meetings, right? It's a nightmare. So there's software you can use where people can just click a calendar. It takes you to be you know, the business owner and be aware of your calendar. Every week, maybe Sunday, you just put together all of your uh, availability that week. People can then book meetings with you. So run through all of the tasks that you put yourself through every single week and then find the repetitive tasks, find it where you don't need to be the one doing it and then automate those. Um, you'll actually love your life so much better whenever you stop doing repetitive tasks. And especially the tasks that don't have personality. Yeah. Scheduling a, nope, not Tuesday at two, how about Wednesday at one? Nope, not Wednesday at one, I got, how about Thursday at three? There's no brand value. Don't waste your time on it. 
I think you touched on the main thing for me is AI is going to be really helpful in helping us streamline a lot of things with our businesses, including marketing. But let's not use, let's not lose the heart side of it, the human being side of it. That's what it's boiling down to for me is it's going to really be helpful. Um, in fact, we might see an influx of content from businesses that are like, oh, this is great. I can crank out 20 blog posts in an hour just by telling some machine to do it. And it may actually work for a little bit, but my long-term prediction is that people will start to notice it. They'll start to still be able to differentiate what they've always been able to differentiate, which is the human being personal touch, the creative side of what that business is doing. And don't right? use AI content for SEO. It will kill your website. <laughs> Google oh, yeah. hates it. Blog posts are fine, for instance, but don't expect it to get you SEO value. Yeah. So just don't lose the personal touch. But do definitely go and see what kind of tools are out there that can help you streamline whatever your industry is. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Uh, uh, let's get some questions. We got one right over here. Right over here? All right. Big burning question. Uh, marketing masterminds on intellectual property rights. What I'm hearing is if I'm going to use... AI to research something concerning my customers. I want to use that as information, but I don't want to reuse that content in my marketing. Am I hearing you right on that? Yeah, you don't want to just replicate what the AI presents to you because it's using existing content. There's no original thought in right. AI. So that content was derived from somewhere. And so on that, big companies like Apple, Amazon, Samsung, Verizon, they've actually banned their, com their workers from using ChatGPT type AI tools from generating anything work-related because you could also lose proprietary information. Mm -hmm. um, that information, the, the other key to this is data and privacy, right? So you put something in ChatGPT, well, how do you get it out? There's no way to really delete it. That goes into that large language model database forever. So you have to be aware of when you're asking for ChatGPT to output something, you're going to want to take that output and then make it your own. That's, again, part of the human element of um, you know, creating something. Yeah. But are you asking legally if you can yeah, just legally, take it? Yeah, I don't know the answer. I will say legally. Who knows this? Legally, can they just, can you use chat yes. BBT content? And let's say on a website. So legally you can because it's from the public domain. We're saying it's not a good idea because of the human factor. And, and Google's saying it's not great content. And he's saying it's not great SEO. Yeah. But from a, from, you could just plop that on your website, guys. Right? You could. Absolutely. The, the other piece, too, is there's no original thought in AI. There is often original text, right? Mm -hmm. So if, as it gives you the bullet point of whatever information, that might be totally unique sentence structure of those words in a combination, but the thought that brought it or the data point that brought it or the whatever is not original. Someday in five or 10 years, maybe we'll have fully intelligent creative AI, but at the moment, no. Well, and, and on that, um, there are tools that you can use to scrub the AI content that's output that will give you is this, you know, plagiarism, is this something that has been just AI's taken and, and plopped in. One thing that I would also warn is that, you know, AI produces some hallucinations, right? So it's just imaginary answers that are not real. There was an attorney that used citations in a court case that the judge was like, this is a really good deposition. However, the citations are all fake. And so the attorney is now going up for review in the bar because they presented this as real legal research and it wasn't. So I would say just use extreme caution in just replicating whatever AI spits out. Because it, it yeah. will give you what you want. <laughs> and exactly. And that might not be real. That leads to the follow on, then I'm going to let you have the microphone. Um, the, um, some of the founders of um, OpenAI and, and leading companies are seeing the dangers of um, that AI can go the wrong direction because of the things you've, you've mentioned. So how wise is it to suggest that your um, customers actually invest in AI for their customer service chat, so, for instance, in, in, in yeah. applications like that? Yeah, so there's, so there's a bunch of different sides to it. I think there are, there are social dangers, just like when social media came out and everyone was like, oh my gosh, it's going to ruin society. Well, and it didn't, but it kind of sort of did, right? And like, um, yeah, but not, but yes. Um, I think that, that's the best comparison I think that everyone's used is like everyone was worried about social media and they were worried that people would stop having human interactions. Well, I still shook hands today. That, that didn't actually happen. 
what did happen is people started living in their own little universe that wasn't connected to much reality, right? Um, which is something that no one ever knew was coming. I think that's exactly how a lot of the experts are talking about AI. They're saying, well, it's gonna change things. We thought we knew it, we, what the internet would change, and it didn't, but it changed totally different things. We thought we knew what social media would change, and it didn't, but it changed totally different things. I think AI is the same way. I do think, though, that it's not going away. There are a lot of people, when Facebook came out, they were like, ah, oh, that's horrible, and I don't like what it's gonna do to society, and so I'm not gonna do it. They're bankrupt. <laughs> they can't, you can't just market in newspapers and expect to survive, right? Um, and I think that's the, that's the big piece is boycotting it on an individual level as a business doesn't do anything. As a society, we need to have conversations and say what kind of content should we allow and should we have these conversations and that kind of thing. As a business, though, boycotting isn't going to do anything, and most tools you use already already have AI and predictive AI inside of them. Gmail, when it says, this is how you probably want to finish your sentence, that's AI. That's AI that's read all your emails and says, probably, you want to say, and have a great day, because you said, and have, probably want to finish it with a great week or a great day, one or the other, right? Um, so it's, it's too late to, to avoid it anyway. You might as well be good at it instead of getting left behind. And it's thoughtful implementation, right? So again, thinking about how your company is going to use these tools, will it be used customer facing or just internally? And then developing an AI tools corporate use policy. How do you expect your employees to use it? What type of behaviors do you expect your employees to engage in when using this technology? And where is that output going to go? You know, do you have checks and balances in place? I think that's where if you just use these tools, you know, shooting from the hip, you're going to get yourself in trouble. But if you have some thoughtful processes behind it, that's going to help you utilize these tools to your best advantage and actually keep up with the marketplace uh, because the businesses that want to exceed what other businesses are doing, you know, and, and beat their competition, they're going to be using whatever tools they have, you know, at their disposal. So it's just about, I think, thoughtful implementation. But like if you're a veterinarian and you put the same prompts into AI that your competitor does down the street, you're going to both sound the same. Yeah. So again, it all comes back to brand and, and why should people care about you and your brand and make sure that's a part of everything that you put out, whether it's an email, your website, an ad, you've got to make sure you read everything you're getting from, from the tech world and make sure it represents you well. Do you have time? Okay. So um, thank you. This is an amazing panel. Thank you so much. Um, and you all talked a lot about the opportunities of AI. And Kathy O'Neill is an author who speaks about a lot of the risks of it. So for the work that I do, um, I work in digital equity with older adults. And one of the things that Kathy O'Neill says is that AI has the potential to scale inequities quickly and severely. So, um, you know, if we talk about using AI, we're connecting with people who are connected with digital resources in the way that you're talking about. And that has the opportunity to cut people in rural areas off. Because if we're only listening to people who are connected to our technology, then we're not hearing the people who are disconnected and we run the risk of losing them even more. So what sort of guardrails do you suggest for businesses in Colorado Springs to set up to use these tools, but to make sure that we're not losing rural people, older adults, people on the other side of the digital divide? I, I mean, I, I think there's a bunch of sides to it. I think it has the same potential to alienate or scale inequities, right? It was a horrible way to say that, but I, it makes sense, right? That's exactly what it is. Um, and I think it's the exact same with social or with internet or with any of the other big things that have changed, right? When the internet came out, they're like, oh, all the rural community is going to be left behind and all the business is going to be in whatever places, right? Um, which did kind of happen, right? A lot of local shops that died because of the internet. Um, I think as far as guardrails for us, it comes back to you need to filter it, right? You need to know that learned biases, which is what that inequity comes from, right? Um, are going to be part of the system. A lot of places, OpenAI and that kind of group, are, are trying to build in guardrails to say, well, don't assume that because 90% of the news stories you hear about this race are X. That, that is what that race is about because that's, Chat, Chat GDP was horribly racist when it first came out because it, all it did was just read general media. Our general media is racist, then so is it, right? Um, but that's one example of like 50. Um, you have to read it 
what Camille was saying, you have to know, you have to add your brand, you have to add your knowledge of the area. You can't just blindly use anything. And the big areas that it impacts is in the research, because it's just pulling what's out there, and in the copy generation. Um, and as long as you're careful with that, and you check and see where, what, what resources did it pull to give me this conclusion, that's, I think, the only, the only way you can be careful of it. I think that, um, again, it goes back to knowing your audience, right? So if your audience is going to be maybe one of these vulnerable communities, you're going to have a lot more thought in how are you reaching out to them, right? There's, AI would not be able to speak to these audiences the way that your actual human you know, workforce could. So I think knowing who your audience is and how you do that is where, as a business, you're going to combat that because knowing that your customers are you know, on like a broadband internet where they don't get the type of speed that people within the city do, you know, that's going to, to change how you interact with them. So I think if you know your audience, you're going to be able to, to combat that pretty easily. But I think from a business perspective, it's, it's going to be about the ethics behind how are you using these tools, right? Like, there's going to be businesses that use these tools for nefarious tactics. I mean, we already know that there's, I don't answer unknown phone numbers on my phone because all it takes is three seconds of your voice and they can generate an entire conversation from that. So there, there's all of these vulnerabilities that exist today for everybody, right? So they can replicate your voice, they can replicate your image, and they can find a couple of pictures of you or you speaking somewhere. So people that are high profile celebrities have this happening all the time to them and it's going to just trickle down. So these um, email campaigns that you get from people that are phishing and scam emails, they're only gonna get more sophisticated. So I think this speaks to everybody and having to understand people might not be who they say they are on the phone if you can't see them. And even as technology evolves with AI, when you see them on a FaceTime, it might not even be the person that you think it is. So I think we, there's a lot to be afraid of on the technology side. I'm terrified of AI on the technological side because I've watched Terminator. I've seen <laughs> Skynet. I, I don't want that to be real. But if you think about the parallels of what's happening, it's a very real possibility. And the engineers that built OpenAI have even said this, that they're afraid of, we've opened Pandora's box and what's gonna happen? So it's a very real fear. And I think that we all probably have to take that seriously in the implementation in our society, you know, in a much broader scale than just in marketing for businesses. I think there's regulation coming. I think that will help this. But I think from a small business perspective, it comes down to education. Because not, not only is there things that you have to be careful of, but there, there's huge opportunities. Think about mental health and what happened during COVID and, and people could get access to mental health care in the comfort of their homes and are largely still doing it. Let's say you suffer from depression. Uh, you don't wanna leave your house, but you can access a therapist, guys, somewhere on another side of the planet. So when it comes to seniors, as an example, as a small business, educate them. You know, what are some great tools that technology can give them that can enhance their life? And what things do you need to be um, watching for and be careful of, whether you're a family member or a small business. I think it gives all of us a lot of responsibly, responsibility and a lot of opportunity. If you think of this AI layer and cautioning our co customers and our clients and um, letting them know all the cool bells and whistles that can make their lives even better. But I think it it's really puts the onus on each of us as family members, as colleagues, as business members, as employers and employees to make sure that we're having these hard discussions and research and talking. And I think that can really help move us forward. Awesome, all right, we've got about five minutes left. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Stan Vandwerf, El Paso County Commissioner. Thank you to the panel for being here and all the, the great conversation that you've had this morning. I do believe, uh, I do have some comments about AI and then I'm gonna ask the panel a question. Uh, so the comments are, I totally agree with uh, what all of you are saying in the realm of there is no substitute for a small business than having a direct interface with the customer because AI systems are not really capable of doing that yet. They're just not. AI systems, if you're even willing to call them that, I'm going to actually make the point, oh, by the way, a little bit of my background. Um, I used to do adaptive radar countermeasures for the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency quote unquote, a form of artificial intelligence, and I was doing that over a decade ago, but I'm here to tell you it's not artificial intelligence. I think this is an overused term, frankly, 
uh, and it's going to be a buzzword, and three or four years from now, we're not going to use it so much anymore. What we're really talking about is rules-based expert systems because you're writing the software code. Because a true AR, AI system would be, you know, like in today's world, garbage in, garbage out. A true AI system would be garbage in, brilliance out. Uh, we don't have that yet today. Or maybe the AI system would come back and tell you your inputs are all awful and we need to fix it. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah. I love it. So and I don't think any of that is going on, uh, on quite yet. So I think it's an, uh, a, a, I see it coming, and we've seen these happen before. You know, I got into the 3D printing business. That was all the rage a few years ago, except that 3D printing had been going on for 30 years. Most people had no, no idea about that. So I think it's a, 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 an incorrectly used term, and we're really dealing with rules-based expert systems. Now, having said that, massive data processing, incredible data processing is happening today, and we can take advantage of that in small businesses. So here's my question for you. I think a great tool for small business is a customer relationship management tool. It actually helps you manage your customers. Now if you've got 10 or 20 customers, you don't need it. But if you've got 100 customers, 1,000 customers, something like that, it becomes hard to remember, what conversation did I have with this person? And, and that software can really, really help manage it. As a county commissioner, I use a customer relationship management tool, and I have 15,000 names in it, to give you a sense. I would, be, it would be, I would be unable to talk to all these people to deal with public policy issues if I didn't have an ability to go back and refer to conversations I've had with a lot of people over and over and over again. So the question, what customer relationship management tool would you recommend for a business that's operating on the small scale of small business, let's say a million dollars or less. So now you've got a price point you've got to kind of worry about, and you need to have some capabilities. But even with it, in the end, that tool is just to tell you who to call so you can make sure that you're assessing how they really feel about your product or service, and you can get that emotional intelligence back, because without that, you're going to be making mistakes. So customer relationship management tool for a business under a million. So I think there's a handful of, of softwares out there that, that would serve this need, but they're usually niche or vertical specific. So one that we use um, for all of my companies is called 17 Hats, and it's 17hats.com, and it is a fully integrated system. You can create workflows where you can send automated emails. You have a customer portal where they can see invoices, they can see conversations, they can share documents and upload. Um, it's one of the software. I've started using this software uh, right when it came out, so I'm a beta user for them, and we had them build some specific things for, for our wedding business, um, and they've just continued to evolve. So there's that one. There's another one we use for our photo booth company called Boothbook, and it has, you know, it's asset management, so our assets that are going out, you can book those and allocate those to different places. Fully fledged CRM has a bunch of automation and tools, has payment portals. Um, there's uh, just tons of different platforms that you could use. You know, you could even just use QuickBooks, right? You can save conversations in QuickBooks. You can have an invoicing platform. I think, again, it depends on analyzing your needs as a small business. What is it that the tool is going to solve for you? And then finding that tool to implement. So you're going to probably try a number one, a, a number of different tools before you find the right one. But I think if you get started, that's what I, I would look at: is look at some of those existing tools that are already doing multiple functions for your business. Yeah, Salesforce is a is a very big one. That's a broad one. But I agree, there are so many good um, CRM systems for industries. Um, many of our clients use experts in their fields, whether it's a hotel or a hospital. So I'd probably use AI to help start you on that journey, find some, and then I call up companies who use that CRM that are similar to yours and find out what, what's good or not good about them. That's how I'd start. Awesome, thanks very much. I wish we had more Q&A time. <laughs> I wish we did, but hopefully our panelists can stay behind and hang out with you guys and answer questions. This is a big conversation. Uh, let's thank our panelists really quick. But let's thank our thank moderator, Adam, here. Yes. Thanks for you the driving thing, the conversation. So. Adam, come back up here. Come back up here. Yeah, thank you, Adam Morley, for being a great uh, facilitator and moderator with a big, a big, big question. So appreciate your round of applause for our moderator today, everybody. Thank you.
And as, as Adam said, you now have two different options. So you can hang around here, talk to the panelists, ask them some more questions, or um, th thank you, by the way, to the Pro Rodeo Hall of Fame. We've got some phenomenal folks here in the back that are the sponsor, uh, site sponsors today. They're going to take you on a tour, if you'd like. So you can leave here, they'll take you on a tour, but you're also welcome to hang out here and talk with our uh, panelists and moderator as well. Um, also, a couple other things really quickly. There are a bunch of um, swag bags over here. So we're hoping that we won't have any to take with us. So this is for you. So pick up some bags uh, on the way. Also want to give a, a huge shout out to Woodlands Deli. They are the small business that donated the catering you see here today. And so we want to shout out them as well. Uh, tomorrow we have our second day. So that's going to be up at iFly. That's up in Monument. And we're going to be talking about the future of work. And we have the state of Colorado. There's actually a department in the state of Colorado for the future of work. So the executive director is going to come down to talk about that. And we also have our UCCS economics professor and that professor is going to talk about what's going on with the economy. So again, what, is, what can your business expect in the future and near future and how you can prepare for that. So please take those bags home. Thank you for everybody who made today possible. Thank you for your great questions. Don't forget to check that website because as the panelists said, we could be here all day talking about that. Hey, one, one clarification uh, from Ashley back here. If you do want to go through the museum, go ahead and go to the main entrance and uh, they'll, you'll be self-guided through the museum. And if you haven't been in it, it's very big and very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Hopefully, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow.